when I was up in the Bay Area last week, I came across a new word, porlessness. Apparently the latest fashion is to say that the Buddha said we are coreless. And that's the meaning of the teaching on that self. And in other words, there's a jumble of karmic, karmic activities that make up a human being. That's what you are. In other words, not self-teaching is a not self-teaching, not a no self-teaching. But what you are is, has no core. It's like a karmic fuzzball. All the fuzz that's picked up as the fuzzball moves across the floor under the force of the wind. It's held together only by static electricity. But there's no real core there. This is supposed to represent what the Buddha taught about what we are. The problem is the Buddha never talked about what we are. That was one of those questions that he consistently avoided. If you say that there's no core there, then when karma ends at nirvana, there'd be nothing left. You would no longer exist. Nothing would exist there. And the Buddha wouldn't have caused to such trouble to say that an arahant after death can't be said to exist or not exist or both or neither. It would be obvious. The arahant wouldn't exist. End of problem. But that's no solution to anything at all. The Buddha was wise enough to see that however you define yourself, you limit yourself. So he wasn't concerned with limiting us or defining us. He wanted to actually create an unlimited happiness or help us find an unlimited happiness. Because that was his main point. Not what we are, but exactly how far can happiness be attained? What kind of happiness? Is really worth the effort put into it? Is there a happiness that doesn't change? Something that once you attain it, it's not going to turn on you. And he found that such a happiness exists. It's the happiness of release, which he actually said is the core of all experience. All dhammas, he said, have release as their core. He used the word for heartwood of a tree, but that's what it basically means. That is the core of everything that really is important. If there were no core at all, we'd just be kind of floating around with nothing of any real solid importance to us or anybody else. It would be a miserable world. And you'd say, well, people can just go do what they want, because there's nothing really there that really matters. But as the Buddha said, suffering matters. Happiness matters. And you think that Given the fact that such a happiness is available, people would want it. But for most people, when they look for the idea of happiness, they look around and say, well, who's doing something that looks like it might make them happy, or who looks attractive, or who looks interesting? And they take those people as their models without really stopping to examine carefully, are those people really happy? And in fact, a solid happiness is possible. Why do we content ourselves with lesser things? So there is a core to experience, and it is a challenge. That may be one of the reasons why people don't like to think about it. It forces them to change their ways too much. But you have to ask yourself, are you serious about being happy? And serious here doesn't mean grim, but it's simply sincere. Do you take your happiness as something important? For the Buddha, that's the beginning of wisdom, is taking your happiness, your desire for happiness, as something important. And then it builds on that. What, when I do what he says, will lead to my long-term welfare and happiness? That's the question that lies at the beginning of wisdom, the beginning of discernment. It's wise because it realizes that happiness is something that comes from your actions. It's not a question of who you are. And second, long-term is better than short-term. This is the question that underlies the practice of what's called merit, doing good things, being generous, being virtuous, having this restraint of goodwill for everybody. It's interesting that goodwill is regarded as a restraint. 
holds, basically holds your actions in check, the actions that would be harmful. What's unlimited about goodwill, of course, is you extend it to everybody. But then the Buddha goes beyond just those practices, because as he said, don't, they don't lead ultimately to nirvana on their own. They don't lead to release. Beyond that, you're looking for a happiness that is more than just long term. It's outside of time entirely, so that time cannot touch it. That's the core we're looking for. And this is where the Buddha expands that question on discernment to the questions about inconstancy, stress, and not self. If we're looking for something that's really beyond time, on the one hand it can't be inconstant, and it can't be stressful. And anything that's less than that, you can't. You want to, don't want to hold on to self. In fact, though, you don't even hold on to the release as self, because the idea of self implies clinging, and clinging stands in the way. So we take the issues of my long-term welfare and happiness, and they get translated into the questions on the three characteristics or the three perceptions. Long-term corresponds to the question about inconstancy. Happiness corresponds to the question on stress. And my, of course, corresponds to the question on self or not self. So when you encounter things in the path of your practice, ask yourself, is this constant or inconstant? Is inconstant? That's stressful and it's not self, nothing you would want to hold on to. Now you will find, though, that in the course of the path there are certain things you do have to hold on to temporarily or provisionally. That's part of the skills you need to get to release. After all, you can't use release to get to release. You have to use what you've got. And the things you've got, form, feeling, perceptions, fabrications and consciousness, the, what the Buddha calls the five aggregates are things that if you simply cling to them are going to cause problems, going to cause suffering. In fact, the cling will be suffering. But if you turn them into a path, like you're doing right now, you're sitting here, you've got your body sitting here, you're holding on to the perception of the breath to give rise to a feeling of ease. You're talking to yourself about the breath, that's fabrication, and your consciousness is aware of all these things. That's taking the five aggregates and making them a path. So those are the things you hold on to provisionally as part of a strategy. But whatever comes up in the course of your meditation, if you want to test to see whether this is the ultimate goal or not, you pull out those three questions. Is it constant or inconstant, stressful or not stressful? And then if it's stressful and inconstant, it's not worth holding on to, not worth claiming as you or yours. So this becomes the touchstone to figure out what really is gold in here, what really is of solid value. Because there is something of solid value. The happiness that the Buddha points to has a solid value. It is something of infinite worth, and it can be touched inside. So we, have a, we as human beings have this potential, and other human beings have this potential too, which is why we want to respect them. So the Buddha doesn't say that we're coreless, he doesn't say what we are, but he does say we have the potential to find this happiness. It's there, and it is the core and the most valuable part of all experience. So keep that in mind as you practice. The question is always, what am I doing and what are the results that I'm getting from my actions? And are they up to standard? And you want to take the Buddha's standards as the ones by which you measure things, if you really are sincere about your happiness. Because that's what it comes down to, the level of your own sincerity. As the Buddha said, one of the treasures of the mind is what he calls compunction, which is the opposite of apathy. Apathy says, oh, I'll do what I want, I don't care about the results. Compunction places all the importance on the results. 
whether something is something you want to do or not want to do, because you like or dislike it, that's not the issue. The issue is, what does it lead to? And the treasure of compunction, this opposite of apathy, is something the Buddha wants us to encourage, to develop within us, so we can find the happiness that he found. in the same way that he found it, by looking inside and seeing that there is something, there is a core in here. It's not necessarily something you would say is you or yours, but it's there. And that's what gives value to everything else. <laughs>